if you're disconnected, please join back. Okay, it's started. Um, welcome, everyone. Good morning. Welcome to a new week. Uh, before we begin, is there anyone who would like to open us in prayer? Let's pray. Dear Heavenly Father, we come to you under the name of Jesus. We thank you for this day. We thank you for the class we are about to have. God, I just pray that uh, as we are listening to the classes, uh, you will guide us. You will uh, fill us with the revelation of who you are. You will help us to understand you better. You will help us to have a deeper relationship with you, Jesus. We give uh, Smita Ma'am into your hands. Be with her and guide her. And uh, I give all the classmates over here, give us good Wi-Fi connection throughout the session that we can uh, glorify your name together by listening and by learning about you, Jesus. We give you all the glory and honor. In Jesus' name we pray. Okay, so uh, last week we oh, I didn't um, <laughs> we covered until chapter eleven. We went into the teaching on head covering, um, and there were questions we hadn't uh, talked about. Uh, before we go into that, uh, maybe we can do a quick review. Uh, Jeffina, would you like to do it? I or if you, <laughs> you're welcome to do it. I think we did from uh, ten five to eleven sixteen. But we can leave eleven out for now because we'll go over eleven again. So maybe just chapter ten. Okay. Um, so we started with. Chapter 10, uh, where we learned about having a right heart attitude. And uh, we also learned that uh, we should not lose our way. And we also saw uh, how the Israelites were lustful, how they were focused on their needy thing, uh, how they were idolaters, how they were uh, sexually immoral, how they were testing Christ and uh, uh, complaining uh, and murmuring uh, through. We were looking back at Numbers chapter 11, I believe so. Uh, to see, to have a comparison of how the uh, Israelites were, Numbers and Exodus, chapter 32, how they were uh, worshipping the idol. Uh, so we were going back and forth, understanding uh, the Israelites, uh, how they were keeping some things about God. Um, I think that's what we saw in that. And we saw how they left their first love and uh, provoked God to uh, jealousy, we, we understood that uh, we can't be part of both demonic as well as the spiritual realm. And we also learned that we should always uh, care for the other person more than us, uh, be willing to do it for the sake of others, no matter what we do. Uh, so we saw uh, four points regarding the sense of eating the food of idols, the spiritual aspect, the worship of God and demons. Uh, and we also evaluated, uh, is it just edifying or is it just the culture? Or, and is it really good for others? Um, yeah, that's one of the things that we saw. And I think after that, we actually moved to chapter 11, I believe so. Thank you. So, yeah, this uh, chapter 10 closed the section on idol worship that uh, Paul had been talking about. So, uh, in the previous chapters, he had just started the introduction to is it okay to eat food offered to idols? He talked about his own life as an example. And then he goes back in chapter 10. Uh, 
to just call uh, to ask people uh, to consider uh, the Israelites example and then looking at the Israelites example, uh, asking people, how can you uh, engage with another uh, demonic power, even if the idol is nothing behind the idol, it is a demonic power. And so when you are participating in something involved with that, uh, you are um, allowing that into your life. Uh, but if you also are participating, uh, taking part in the Lord's Supper and uh, a part of that as well, we are a part of Christ, then you cannot also be part of the demonic realm. So um, there's a lot more yeah, that that chapter talks about, but that's the, uh, the general summary of it. So uh, we can go back into chapter 11. Um, we covered uh, some of this last week, but we look at it again, and then we'll also uh, look at any questions uh, that we have, uh, that anyone has. Uh, so chapter 11, verse 1, basically concludes the previous section. So he, uh, Paul is calling uh, the Corinthians to imitate him just as I imitate Christ. So that was the same thing where he had given his own life as an example, and then he concludes the uh, idol worship uh, passage and then this actually is the last statement that can be added to the previous chapter uh, rather than starting this next section um, and then in verse 2 is where he starts the next section um, and he's talking about traditions that have been passed on to them now in the next few verses and chapters is where he'll start to address some of that. Uh, so uh, the Lord's Supper, he talked about uh, in this chapter. And so we look at that um, today, I think. So from verses three onwards is where he, three to 16, is where he talks about uh, spiritual headship and the head covering. So uh, there are many things that he addresses here. Uh, maybe we can first address, okay, I, I don't know if we should go back over all of this, but uh, we'll go do a quick summary of it and then we'll ask questions. Okay, so uh, verse three, but I want you to know that the head of every man is Christ, the head of woman is man, and the head of Christ is God. Um, so here he's, uh, first addressing this issue of headship, where God the Father is head, Christ uh, Christ is after, man is after, and woman is after. So uh, the head of woman is man, the head of man is Christ, and the head of Christ is God. Um, so we can see very clearly here that the kind of headship he's talking about is uh, a question of authority, uh, question of um, someone having some position of power. Uh, but at the same time, when we see the head of Christ is God, we understand that Christ, uh, Jesus Christ and the Father are equal. They're co-equal. They have uh, equal power, equal standing. Uh, but Christ willingly submitted himself, like we saw in, uh, in the book of Philippians. Uh, that Christ submitted himself. So in the same way, uh, this chapter will talk about how uh, the woman is to submit to the man, uh, but um, we'll also look at whether he's talking about women in general or women in a marriage relationship. Um, so verse four, every man praying or prophesying, having his head covered, dishonors his head. So uh, when he's saying that if a man covers his head, he dishonors uh, his own head, but he dishonors Christ, right? Because right before this, he has said Christ is the head uh, of man. Uh, so almost like the uncovering of one's head was a sign of a position of authority in that culture. Now, we can't say that in our culture today. There is nothing. Uh, there's nothing we see around us that tells us if your head is uncovered, you have a position of authority, or if you have, if your head is um, 
is covered, then you're in a place of submission. That is not what we see in our churches. And we all come from different places, different cultures. Uh, so we can testify to the fact that in different cultures, these covering the covering of the head or the uncovering of the head will probably mean different things. Uh, and he's also talking specifically in the context of praying or prophesying. Uh, verse 4, every man praying or prophesying. So in this context, when you're praying or prophesying, a man should not have his head covered. Um, on the other hand, verse 5, every woman who prays or prophesies with her head uncovered dishonors her head. Uh, so that is the same as her having her head shaved. And then verse six: If a woman is not covered, let her also be let her head be shaved. Uh, but if it's shameful for her head to be shaved, then let it be covered. So um, here he's saying the opposite, right? So he's saying women uh, must cover their heads when they're praying or prophesying, uh, because if they don't cover their heads, then they are dishonoring their head. So dishonoring their head again that uh, dual meaning of dishonoring their own selves, but dishonoring uh, the person who is in a position of authority over them. So in this case, they are dishonoring the man, right? Uh, because we saw the head of the woman is man. Um, so uh, why can we, why do we take this as a marriage relationship, uh, specifically for married people? Because uh, the word that's used for man and woman can also be translated husband and wife. Uh, but the other thing is uh, the woman cannot be dishonoring all men by keeping her head uncovered, right? It's not, um, it, it's not uh, that all men have some claim over a woman or all men in some way are affected by what one woman chooses to do. So uh, understanding that there is a special relationship, and even as he goes on in this, we'll see, he's uh, talking uh, specifically about how God created Adam and Eve, and Adam and Eve were husband and wife. So uh, taking that into account as well. Okay, and then he uses the example of if her head was shaved, that would be a shame to her. So using nature's example, like naturally, uh, women have long hair, and he'll also state that a little later. So just going by what is natural, uh, if it is natural for a woman to have long hair, then uh, it must be that that covering is something that God has given. Uh, but if it is shameful for her to shave her head, then it is also shameful for her to leave her head uncovered. Um, so he's saying it's as bad as shaving your head. So if you're going to leave your head uncovered, then just you might as well just shave your head uh, because you're shaming yourself to that extent. Um, now we know that in in different cultures, it is common for women to have their head shaved. So again, uh, this is in this culture, in this setting. Okay, so uh, it doesn't mean that no women should ever shave their head, right? Or no women should ever cut their hair short. That is uh, that is for that day because that's how uh, women received glory was through their hair. Uh, it was considered as a woman's glory to have long hair. Uh, so it was also considered, like we talked about last week, an object of lust. Um, so when people, when a woman left her hair uncovered, it was like she was trying to provoke lust in uh, a man, so trying to get his attention. Uh, so this uh, idea of covering the head is also uh, to encourage modesty within the church, uh, especially among wives, because they were to honor their husbands uh, and submit themselves to their husbands and acknowledge that they are already committed to one man. Uh, so verse 7, for a man indeed ought not to cover his head, since he is the image and glory of God, but woman is the glory of man. So. Uh, man uncovers his head because he is the first created and he carries that authority uh, that God had given him uh, right at the start, right? When God created, uh, we see in Genesis, God created man and woman in his image. So it's not saying that only man was created in the image of God, but he was the one who was created 
first. And he was created uh, just out of the mud. Uh, but woman was created from man itself. Uh, and so it shows that she has been created from man and that's why she covers her head. So she shows that uh, she is under man's authority. Whereas man, uh, because he was not created from another creation, but just from God himself, uh, he shows his position of authority under Christ uh, by leaving his head uncovered. Uh, and then it goes on to explain, man is not from woman, but woman from man. Nor was man created for the woman, but woman for man. So we see that in the Genesis account, right? Uh, the, the man was created first, and then woman was created from man. And then verse 9, uh, the man was created, and then woman was created for the sake of man, to help him, to be a companion to him. Uh, so, so this is the example that Paul is using. So this is proof that because man was created first, he has some position of authority. And then the woman came second to support the man. And uh, she also came, she was created out of the man. Uh, verse 10, uh, for this reason, the woman ought to have a symbol of authority on her head because of the angels. So if he's saying the same thing, so she must show that she, uh, came from man and because of the angels uh, we see that uh, the angels uh, we are testifying to the angels so the church is a testimony to angels we see in ephesians 3 10 uh, paul says this to the intent that now the manifold wisdom of god might be made known by the church to the principalities and powers in the heavenly places uh, so the church is supposed to be displaying God's wisdom to all principalities and powers. That is, that includes the angels. So when uh, the woman acts outside of that wisdom, uh, then it is not. She's not displaying that to uh, to the angels, or to these principalities and powers. Okay, uh, verse ten. Verse 11, um, so Paul has used this example from Genesis, but he's saying, okay, before we take this too far, I'm not trying to say that uh, women are less than men. So I'm going to clearly, so he's, he's saying he's using the example from Genesis to say, to make his point, but he's also saying, let's not take it too far. So 11 and 12 is, uh, man is not independent of woman, nor is woman independent of man. So although woman came from man and was created for man, it doesn't mean that she is dependent on man and man himself is completely independent. He's saying we're both mutually dependent. Um, and then verse 12, for as woman came from man, even so man also comes through woman, but all things are from God. So remember that we are all, yeah, we are all dependent on each other and we're at the end of the day, completely dependent on God. Uh, so his, whatever he's saying is just to serve the purpose of showing this headship, showing that uh, place of, um, to show, to honor the person who is in a place of authority but not to say that women are less or uh, men are uh, men are in a place of glory, women are in a place of shame, nothing like that. Uh, it's just to serve that teaching that he is uh, giving them. Uh, in verse 13, he'll continue. So this is where he talks about what is natural for a woman. Uh, judge among yourselves is proper for a woman to pray with her head uncovered. Does not even nature itself teach you that if a man has long hair, it is a dishonor to him? But if a woman has long hair, it is a glory to her, for her hair is given to her for a covering. So he's just talking. Uh, so this is sort of like a philosophical argument. If you look at nature itself, nature itself shows us that women naturally have long hair and men naturally have short hair. And so uh, if we're just to follow the natural way of things, then we understand that women should have a head covering 
should have their heads covered and women, men uh, don't need to have their heads covered. And verse 16, if anyone seems to be contentious, we have no such custom law to the churches of God. Um, so this is to say that uh, from here, we're saying this is not a custom for everybody. Uh, but he's saying this is for the Corinthian church. So this is not uh, something that is followed in all the churches. Um, so that is, uh, that's pretty much the end of it. So verse 16 can be understood in two ways. It can also be understood again as another philosophical argument of this is just the way things are in this culture. This is the way we need to follow it. Uh, that's one side of it. The other side is we have no such custom now to the churches of God to say that this is not something that is followed by all the churches, uh, but uh, is something within this cust uh, within this church. Um, so that covers this whole section. Before we move on, are there questions that people would like to bring up? Um, just a clarification, maybe maybe not a question. Uh, in verse nine, uh, you were comparing it with uh, Ephesians chapter three, verse ten, I believe. So, have a symbol of authority on her head because of the angels. Uh, can I? Can you just repeat me uh, the explanation so I get a clear understanding? Ah, uh, yes. Uh, so that is. Um, Verse 10, for this reason, the woman ought to have a symbol of authority on her head because of the angels. Uh, so uh, in Ephesians, maybe we can go to that uh, chapter, Ephesians 3. Let's just open that up. Uh, Evan's able to hear me okay, and yeah, this connections. Okay, so uh, we'll be looking at Ephesians uh, 3.10. So it says, his intent was that now through the church, the manifold wisdom of God should be made known to the rulers and authorities in the heavenly realm. Um, so in this, Paul is saying that the church is supposed to display God's wisdom. Uh, and we are supposed to be a witness of God's wisdom to... Uh, to the spiritual realm, right? So rulers and authorities in the heavenly realms. And so if we are not following God's wisdom in one way or another, then we are not uh, fulfilling that, uh, that calling that is upon the church. So uh, in that way, we are actually given a place of privilege uh, over the spiritual realm, where the church itself is an extension of God's uh, God's glory, right? We manifest God's glory. We manifest his wisdom, his power, his authority. Um, so in all of these things, even in the ways we uh, function, in the things we do within the church, all of these things should reflect that godly wisdom. That uh, So in this case where God is the head and he has placed, he's given authority uh, in the church uh, to people in a certain way. So here he's given um, men authority over women within the marital relationship. So if we are not following that, then we are dishonoring God and we are not uh, fulfilling the purpose of the church to, re to reflect or to reveal God's wisdom uh, to the spiritual realm. So is that clear or... Uh, 
Any other questions? So uh, I just want to make sure I'm understanding it right. So you're basically saying we are displaying the wisdom of God uh, through the duck of covering the head, or uh, that's what you're mm, trying to say. OK, uh, so I have one more question. We saw that uh, the culture also, uh, that the prostitute actually leave their heads uh, uncovered over the place. I think uh, that's what we saw. Prostitute. Yeah, they leave their head uh, uncovered, and that's why Paul intentionally mentions here to cover cover the head. Uh, so, uh, is there any reason why it says uh, the man shouldn't don't doesn't have to cover his head? And uh, also in verse seven, we see poor man indeed out not to cover his head since he's the image and glory of God, but women is the glory of man. So, I uh, just to make sure I'm understanding right, so that I don't have doubts later. <laughs> Uh, verse 7 it says for man indeed out not to cover his head since he is the image and glory of God but women is the glory of man so uh, so I just want to know I'm understanding it right so man is not covering his head because he's created in the image of God is that the only reason that's is that what he's trying to say or is there any other reason that man should not cover his head uh -huh. Okay, so specifically about why men should not cover their heads, right? Uh, so it's the same as women covering. It's a cultural thing. So like he's telling the women, you should cover your head uh, from a cultural perspective uh, that when you leave, this main thing of the hair was an object of lust. So that's why uh, prostitutes would leave their head uncovered. Uh, so in the same sense, he's saying, uh, in a cultural thing, it is not appropriate for a man to cover their head. So, uh, um, so there were uh, parts of the of that culture where it was customary for men to cover their heads. Uh, so he's talking to this specific group of people, and it probably is within this group that it's not appropriate to cover your head. Uh, whereas in other parts, men did cover their head. So the fact that he's saying don't cover your head means that in this in this culture, in this group of people, it was uh, not something that was practiced. Uh, because we know that in other places there was head covering in that time. Uh, but the other thing is, yeah, yeah, since he's the image and glory of God, but woman is the glory of man, he doesn't yeah. say the woman is the image of the man. Uh, so so when he's saying he's the image and glory of God, it doesn't mean that the woman is not the image of God. Okay, so men and women uh, in Genesis, we see uh, he created them in the image of God, male and female, he created them. So both may, uh, men and women are created in the image of God. Um, but here he's specifically saying that the man uh, was reflecting God's glory in a way that God had created him to carry out his purposes uh, on earth. Okay, so God had said, you are going to be my representative on earth, right? And God had created man to do that. Uh, and then he created women to, uh, to support and help the man. So the, he was the glory of God in that he was the one who was entrusted with God's work on earth. And then the woman was... Uh, was created to be his partner in that. And so she is the glory of man because she is doing that work with the man uh, to fulfill God's calling or God's purposes for creating men and women. Uh, so, yeah, that's the... Okay. okay, any other questions? Then we'll uh, continue in this chapter. So, uh, so Paul is looking at different aspects of the uh, church service, right? So, he's first he was talking about 
uh, how people should pray and prophesy, how men and women should pray and prophesy. Uh, the next, he's going into the Lord's Supper and he's talking about how should the Lord's Supper be practiced uh, within the church. Uh, so if somebody can read those verses, 17 to 34. First Corinthians eleven, verses seventeen to thirty-three. First Corinthians chapter eleven, verses seventeen to thirty-four. Now, in giving these instructions, I do not praise you, since you come together not for the better, but for the worse. First of all, when you come together as a church, I hear that there are divisions among you, and in part I believe it. For these, there must also be factions among you, that those who are approved may be recognized among you. Therefore, when you come together in one place, it is not to eat the Lord's Supper. For in eating, each one takes his own supper ahead of others, and one is hungry and another is drunk. What what do you not have houses to eat and drink in or do you despise the church of god and shame those who have nothing what shall i say to you shall i praise you in this i do not praise you for i received from the lord that which i also delivered to you that the lord jesus on the same night in which he was betrayed took bread and when he had given thanks he broke it and said take eat this is my body which is broken for you do this in remembrance of me. In the same manner, he also took the cup after supper, saying, This cup is the new covenant in my blood. This do as often as you drink it in remembrance of me. For as often of you, for as often as you eat this bread and drink this cup, you proclaim the Lord's death till he comes. Therefore, whoever eats this bread or drinks this cup of the Lord in an unworthy manner will be guilty of the body and the blood of the Lord. But let a man examine himself, and so let him eat of the bread and drink of the cup. For he who eats and drinks in an unworthy manner eats and drinks judgment to himself, not discerning the Lord's body. For this reason, many are weak and sick among you, and many sleep for if we would judge ourselves we would not be judged but when we are judged we are being chastened by the Lord that we may not be condemned with the world therefore my brethren when you come together to eat wait for one another but if anyone is hungry let him eat at home lest you come together for judgment and the rest I will set in order when I come so so uh, he switches here. So in verse 17, um, he says, okay, now in the, the set of instructions that I'm going to give you, uh, I cannot praise you because when you're coming together, actually your meetings are doing more harm uh, rather than uh, edifying you or building you up as a church. So that is a problem. A uh, very sad thing, right? So that uh, when we're coming together to worship God, we're coming to fellowship, uh, that actually uh, the body of Christ is being harmed rather than uh, being built up, rather than there being an increase in unity and love. Uh, there is uh, there is a breaking down of that unity through these gatherings. Um, Verse 18, for first of all, when you come together, I hear that there are divisions among you, and in part, I believe it. Um, so sadly, like here, he's talking about this specifically in the Lord's Supper, but we see this uh, also in so many of our churches today, that uh, there is, people are coming together to worship, uh, but there is division uh, amongst the believers. It's a very sad thing. Um, are there divisions that you all have seen in churches that you've been part of or churches that you know of? And what are those the divisions that you all have seen? What kinds of divisions? I have seen uh, caste divisions among the people. I think that's one of the worst things that could uh, happen in a church and i have also seen the division of 
people who are in authority uh, or people who take care of things in church uh, they have a very special favor from the uh, pastor and the leaders and those who just come to the church they don't have uh, some favors uh, and i think that's also one of the worst divisions that could happen in church Yeah. So, uh, in many parts of India, uh, the issue of uh, caste, where uh, people come from a certain background, uh, their families come from a certain background, and um, there is a sort of hierarchy uh, where if you belong to this background, then you have uh, you have some kind of power. You have position a status that is different from someone from a, another background and so um, that division then based on your background where one group of people won't interact with the other group of people or will look down on the other group uh, those kinds of things so even though we're gathering as a church we're meeting uh, for uh, a church service or uh, any other gathering, uh, people will stick to their groups based on whatever their background is. So they'll stick to their group of people and will not interact with the other group. Um, and then the other side of if you're in a place of authority, having, uh, having, enjoying some privileges that the rest of the congregation doesn't enjoy. Um, anything else anyone has seen in? their churches or observed in the church in general and yeah i think even the rich and poor is, is still there in some churches uh because if if a church needs something uh to build something new or they are in let's say they are in need of more chairs or tables or anything so obviously the preferent they rely more on the rich people in the church and they give them some special favors because they believe they can give them the money and that difference is always there so when a rich person comes to church there are some separate dress bags separate chairs <laughs> or separate place for them to sit uh separate snacks and cool drinks for them or something it's funny to see all these things sometimes but yeah uh, it, it still happens uh church has quite become like a, like a polit political thing where they just do something just to just a comparison of churches whether my church is better or your church is better <laughs> those kind of things so yeah So this is uh, based on their uh, financial status, right? So the rich are given more. What is amazing is like all of these examples are actually even talked about in scripture, right? It's not something that's new or unique to the present day church. It's right from the early church that those things uh, distinctions between the rich and the poor um, and what we see in the Corinthian church between the elite and the those from the lower classes um, and uh, and yeah so this basic discussion that Paul is having on the Lord's Supper actually involves a lot of that that elitism versus the lower classes um, okay I can see Rosalind has posted if there are rich tithers, the pastor will visit them. And if they have any functions at home, uh, but for others who are not so rich, uh, any function, the pastor will send the elders or leaders to do the function. Yeah, so we give more uh, more attention or more importance to uh, those who are wealthy because they are also tithing and contributing towards the functioning of the church. So uh, pastors feel uh, this pressure to please those uh, those who are contributing because they may lose their contributions. Uh, and so then that affects the functioning of the church. Uh, so these are very sad things where we start to depend on people. Uh, we start to uh, depend on the money that's coming in rather than recognizing that God is the one who uh, supplies all our needs and the church runs uh, on his grace, his provision. Uh, 
so this is where money can become a very um, uh, a downfall for churches, right? So we've allowed uh, money to determine the courses of action that we take as a church. Uh, we've allowed money to determine how we treat people, uh, how we interact with them, the kind of respect we show to them, the kind of services in this case, like Rosine said. So the pastor will uh, serve these people, but if it's someone from a poorer uh, background, then uh, he won't necessarily go in, but he'll send other people from the church, elders from the church. Uh, so, uh, thank you all for sharing. So, uh, so division in the church is not a new thing, right? So we see that in this, uh, in the Corinthian church. Um, and he's saying, uh, I hear that these divisions are there when you all are gathering. So in this time of coming together, there are divisions among you. Um, and then he he talks a little bit sarcastically in verse nineteen. Uh, there must be these divisions among you because through these divisions, it proves those who are actually uh, approved by God and those who are not. Uh, so he's almost saying like, you are coming and you'll have these divisions among you, but your divisions are serving the purpose of showing that uh, those who have this wrong attitude towards others are the ones who God doesn't approve of. You yourselves are proving uh, that you all are not in line with God through these divisions. Um, verse 20, therefore, when you come together in one place, it is not to eat the Lord's Supper. So he says, you all are coming together and uh, your, uh, your intent is to participate in the Lord's table, but uh, that may be what you are doing when you all come, but actually that's not the real goal. That's not the real desire of your heart. Uh, because in verse 21, he says, for in eating, each of you are more concerned about food for yourselves. Right? You all are, uh, you all are concerned more about satisfying your own hunger to the extent that one person remains hungry and the other person has overindulged and actually is drunk. Uh, so he's talking about both food and drink because uh, there was uh, wine in in as part of their meals, but that wine would not have been uh, highly alcoholic. But because they were drinking so much, uh, they were getting drunk. Uh, while on the other hand, there were people who were leaving that gathering still hungry. They hadn't even eaten. Um, uh, so this also actually points to the culture of that day. So it was common for the church to meet in patrons' houses. So there were no church buildings uh, where they were gathering. So meeting in people's houses, um, and it was usually a rich person. Uh, and in that culture, uh, during the meal time, there would be one main area where the rich people would sit and eat. And there was another area where the poorer or lower class people would eat that was kind of, uh, they could see each other. So the people from the main area could see the people from the other, uh, the uh, kind of the secondary area for those from a lower or the poorer people. And usually within that uh, main area, the food and the wine was of better quality than the area where the poorer people were sitting. So this was always something that was uh, kind of people people in that uh, secondary area were not happy because the food quality was not good. This is in the general culture, not specifically in the church, but in the culture that was the practice. Uh, and so this seems to have transferred into the church where uh, they were meeting in the house and these rich people were sitting together in that uh, that area and they were uh, enjoying themselves, they were eating and drinking, um, but the poorer people were being forgotten. Uh, so they were still getting their food, but obviously not enough to satisfy their hunger. Um, and it seems to be that this was the attitude within the church that each one was trying to satisfy their own uh, appetite. So it says each one takes his own supper ahead of others. So everyone was just concerned about eating. They'd forgotten what was the purpose of them gathering. Um, and so this was supposed to be like we read in the Old Testament, uh, 
the Passover meal, right? Where they gathered and they celebrated Passover as a family, as a community, uh, to remember what uh, what God had done for them, how He had rescued them from Egypt. So this was supposed to be a continuation of that practice. So it was supposed to be a meal uh, that they were having, but uh, the problem was that they had they had uh, taken the Greek feasts, the pagan feasts, and they had kind of mixed it with this Passover meal, and it had become something where people are uh, are engaging in gluttony and drunkenness at the end of it. Um, so we'll just take a break, and then we'll continue in 10 minutes. Um, 